Senator Bean. Senator Burnsgetter. Senator Esslinger. Here. Senator May. Here. McCreary. Here. Mosley. Here. Rowden. Here. Thompson Rader. Trent. Okay, uh, we have a quorum, uh, and so we will start today. I'm not going to go executive session until we get some more members here. Uh, so the first thing up today we'll hear is um, Senator Rowden on Senate Bill 829. <laughs> this is huge. What is it? It's here. Oh, yeah, it's a fix from last year. Senator Rod, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. Don't you dare. You can have my job if you want <laughs> Don't it. Don't you actually. dare. Um, uh, privilege to be here before you today to present Senate Bill 829. Um, uh, this, this bill deals with renewable natural gas. Just a brief overview of history that got us here in 2021. We, the General Assembly, passed legislation to promote the investment, uh, investments in uh, renew, renewable natural gas, which I will call RNG from this point forward. Um, it's a natural gas derived from organic waste, um, from cow operations, hog operations, landfills, etc. Uh, it provides a unique opportunity for us to diversify our state's energy sources. Um, the legislation passed in 2021, and it permits gas corporations to recoup the cost of these prudent uh, RNG investments to make the projects feasible. Uh, we are three years later into the process now, and Missouri hasn't been able to fully implement the program uh, quite in the way that I, I think was envisioned in, in uh, 2021. Um, the stakeholders, many of which are here and will, will testify after me, uh, have been working together uh, with the PSC and others to try and just craft language that would uh, tweak it a little bit to, to allow for the program to work as it was envisioned. Um, the main, uh, there's a couple of changes that are um, being made subsequently. Um, it directs the PSC to promulgate rules uh, that would allow for uh, this, these uh, changes to be made. Uh, it also says that once the RNG project is approved by the PSC, that the cost of the project would be spread across the rate base as it is in, in uh, you know, most other projects that you see in, in other types of, um, of, of energy. So with these changes, hopefully uh, we can spur on these um, renewable natural gas investments uh, and uh, bring just more, more power and reliable energy to uh, the great state of Missouri. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I know there's some folks here going to testify. Thank you. Any questions for this for Senator Rob? Seeing none. How many people want to testify in favor of this bill? How many opposed? Okay. Uh, first person uh, in favor, please come forward. Everybody, make sure you leave a witness form and let us know who you are. Mr. Chairman, David Winton here on behalf of Summit Natural Gas and Liberty Utilities. Want to go on record in support of Senate Bill 829. Thank the sponsor and thank the committee for your all's time. Um, you might recall several years ago. Um, you, I think, Mr. Chairman and Senator McCreary visited one of these biodigester projects um, in northwest Missouri. Um, it was my first time doing that as well. It's an incredible set of projects where you can trap methane that is coming out of <laughs> either a lagoon or a landfill, um, trap it, biodigest it, and create a uh, usable gas product to go into a pipeline. You know, these projects are gaining momentum and speed. Um, both of the companies that I represent have a sincere desire to begin putting these projects in the ground and working on them. Um, this bill will give some clarity to how uh, those projects will be funded and recouped um, as the costs are, are sunk in. One of the important things to remember from uh, three years ago when we did this was the, these projects do not get any recovery until they are in the ground and operational. So there is no cost wall in progress or anything like that that's put in. The projects have to be approved by the PSC and go through the process. Um, I have to say the, uh, the chair of the PSC and their staff have been incredible in working with us over the last five and six weeks. Hopefully we'll have uh, a draft of a committee substitute for your consideration next week that has reflects their, con their concerns and changes and they've absolutely made this bill much better as, as we've gone through this process. 
So I'd be happy to answer any questions, but really appreciate your time. Thank you. So has the PSC made a decision that we're trying to undo, or what, what exactly is was the cause of this need? Sure. So uh, when the PSC started doing the rulemaking process on this bill so that they could create some clarity for the companies, there was a question about interpretation, one of the central themes in the bill, and there was a question as to whether or not the bill suggested that I'm gonna, I, I want to make sure I try and do this correctly, that the companies were required to create these projects, but the rate payers could be, it could be optional for the rate payers to pay for those projects. Um, having been here three years ago, many of you were, that was not the intention of the bill. The bill was to go through the PSC, have these projects be approved, and then they would roll into the rate base. They are such small projects as a percentage of the overall portfolio of the companies that they'll have almost no material impact on, on the rates in general. Um, but the idea that you know, we, we did voluntary on consumers and mandatory on companies was, um, we weren't sure how, to, how that interpretation came about, but that's what precipitated the need for the bill. And all the issues with prudence will still be still be used by the PSC? So uh, the PSC has suggested an alternative to that language. Um, it's, it is true that there is no project right now that will produce natural gas um, at a level where you would be able to um, sell that for less than or equal to the natural gas you get out of a wellhead, whether it's from Southern Star or somewhere else. And so the PSC has suggested instead of using the prudency definition that we consider that, that we put a cap on the amount of projects that are available for this consideration, and then they judge those projects on the reasonableness of the cost. So are we, are we spending those dollars wisely? Are these reasonable costs that get us to the product that we're looking at? Because um, if they use the traditional definition of prudency, it will be extremely difficult for us to get any of these projects approved and moving forward. And over time, these projects are going to get cheaper, more efficient. We're going to be faster uh, in terms of production. The project that's in Springfield right now that's covered the landfill is, I don't know how many years old that is, but the technology that exists today is far more efficient, you know, than it was 20 years ago. Well, thank you. Questions from the panel? Senator, go ahead. Uh, David, what you just mentioned, is that in the language or that would have to come out in a sub? So that's in the, the, the prudency conversations in the sub. That was, uh, we talked, you don't have it in front of you. I, I'm sorry, Senator McCreary. This was one of the issues that we've been working on with okay. the ESC. So is the they hearing today on the sub or the actual bill that we're looking at? Uh, probably both, because I don't have the sub either. But before we do, I'll make sure to come and talk to you. We have plenty of time to look at it before we okay. move it out. Okay? Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, then maybe my, so my question was uh, on the original bill. Sure. It says that the commission, meaning the Public Service Commission, shall issue a decision within 90 days. Is that um, reasonable? I mean, I, we see thing, we're, we're seeing more and more legislation that's trying to force decisions on a commission that has a lot of job openings sure. and um, not commissioners themselves, but teams. So is 90 days reasonable or does that mean other work gets pushed aside so they can meet that deadline? So that was one of the topics of conversation with the PSC in, in the proposed, it, I'm testifying on the bill itself, but, but the conversations um, have led to language that we would like you to consider that for small projects, projects under $5 million, there's a 90 day threshold to get those approved and the PSC could have an optional 60 days if they need them to approve those projects and then other projects that are larger, more complex, would be, would be at the, you know, the, the speed at which the commission could, could produce that result. Okay. And that's in the sub, too? That will be in the sub. All right. In the proposal. Senator May. This is just a simple question. What's the, um, what's the benefit of, you know, repealing the, repealing the um, provision, giving the commission the general rulemaking authority versus the voluntary you know, uh, process by the gas. Yeah, so um, the repeal of the rulemaking and the, and the in, so we repealed and replaced on the rulemaking to be more specific because it took a long time to get the commission to start moving on rules on this issue. They have since really done an incredible job in the last six months on this issue. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see in the substitute senator that 
we've extended that to another six months and that seems to be acceptable so there'll be a nine month window for how long it would take to promulgate the rules the commission is currently promulgating rules under the existing statute and so what we hope will happen is that they'll simply amend those rules to reflect the changes that are made if if the changes are made in in this legislature okay and again I'm gonna make sure that you, everybody has conversations on this before we ever vote this out thank you any other questions seeing none thank you David thank you sir next in favor please come forward Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Larry Ployce of Spire, Missouri Natural Gas. Uh, first thing I want to try to address is a couple of the questions, and uh, Mr. Winton did a good job of addressing them. But in terms of the timeline for the commission to review and when the sub comes in, I don't anticipate any problems between uh, the regulatory body and the companies as far as that timeline. Whatever timeline they need, I think, to do that. These projects will not be anything to the level of a rate case or any real long uh, drawn out legal process from our perspective you're going to look at the components of the project we actually have entered into without this legislation you know being anticipated to be used we have entered into a contract with the city of kansas city to capture uh, the methane off of their uh, wastewater treatment project so we we are we are pausing on a few other projects to look at and again, as a company, we're looking at maybe the agreeing with the commission and staff on a cap to address some of these issues. And the caps that we've been talked about are minor enough that from a rate making perspective, even though the, create, the gas that, that, that is created out there is much more costly, the impact on rates is very, very nominal. So it will be less than 5% the cap probably for us in terms of the impact on the rates. We have, you know, many of these projects take an environmental bad and make them an environmental good. So you've got to release the methane, you're capturing it um, in an agricultural environment. I think Mr. Winton mentioned, you're also capturing the smell, which makes your neighbors much happier. So you're, you're working on projects that turn this in. And the hope is, as you move to more and more of these projects, that you're going to create an economy of scale and things will get much more efficient. And we've already seen that happen to some extent. And if you can imagine in this, in the building here for a particular, a lot of conversations around landfills. If you can consolidate the, the footprint of a landfill by whatever, whatever project that ends up being, digestion or whatever, and you shrink that landfill, imagine what you can do in terms of the life of that and the need to build other landfills in different jurisdictions. Um, when, with, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We, we look forward to working more on these projects but also being responsible financially to our customers with what, what the impact of those things are. So what's, uh, just today in today's market, what's the price for this kind of regenerated gas versus uh, something out of fracking? On, on the gas side, Senator? Uh -huh. You're probably looking at about four times the expense. Four times, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Next, in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Zach Pollock with the Missouri Natural Gas Association. No need to uh, go over what the previous two witnesses said. Uh, want to go on record in support of the bill. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you. Next in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Zach Monroe on behalf of Amherst, Missouri, here to speak in favor of the bill, specifically clarifying the voluntary nature of the program. Thank you. Questions for? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry, just here to speak in favor of the bill, specifically uh, the provision seeking to clarify the voluntary portion of the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else in favor? Please come forward. First person opposed, please come forward. Hey there, thank you for Good hearing me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Ethan Duke. I'm with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. And I came up here today to uh, talk about this bill in particular and this particular committee because I think there's a couple things that are, are not being seen clearly enough. And it was reflected in the testimonies I just heard, actually. 
Um, first of all, the term renewable, from my lens, this isn't truly a renewable gas. So when you're thinking about it economically, just kind of keep that in mind. I heard this is turning an environmental bad into an environmental good. Um, there's been some great recent reporting. Um, that's just not true. And if I know it might not be very exciting to listen about the nuances of gas, you know, but if you look at the actual natural gas versus this gas, this gas is worse. It pollutes more. The whole process is worse. Um, and you're just kind of incentivizing this this to continue. And when you look at it through an economic lens, you think about costs. This is supposed to be cheaper, not costing people more. Well, this, this particular industry that's doing this is heavily subsidized. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars going into this. That's taxpayer dollars. So that's, that's a monetary cost. But there's another cost that we're ignoring. The, the actual beginning of the pipeline that produces all this stuff, there's usually communities that are historically overlooked that are directly impacted by this. They have health costs. We have environmental costs. There's a lot, there's a lot of problems in it, and there's a bill right now we just went to a hearing on that had to deal with something that would seem tangential, but it's not. It was about the waters of the state and protecting our waters. That bill is sponsored by a district that has the most of this type of originating pollution in the state. So there's a lot of, I understand commerce, I understand economics, I just want to be clear-eyed about this, and, and I, I oppose this one. So any questions, I'll be happy to Thank answer. Thank you. Questions for this witness? All right. Senator May. Excuse me. So what, so what is your suggestion on, you know, I heard the previous testimony, you know, the methane gas, you know, what is your suggestion on capturing it and preventing it from being harmful to the environment? What's your suggestion? Stop giving government subsidies to, well, first of all, as we incentivize this, this is not just about capturing and dealing with that's kind of a, their narrative, right? Actually what it's doing is it's incentivizing the rapid increase in this industry. This is a nationwide industry, primarily in dairy right now. So you're talking about renewable energy? Yeah. Oh, we're talking about what? I say, so you said it's a rapid industry. Which industry are we talking about? Um, digestate um, capture, the capture of methane from digestate. The capture of methane yep. from digestate. Yep. So what is your suggestion? My suggestion is to not monetize something that's this dangerous. That's my suggestion. And we shouldn't be producing this way. So you say not monetize it. Hmm. Yep. So how would you suggest, you know... Not, not monetizing and allowing some people to make money off of it while other people have to t take shoulder the burden. So what's the balance? I mean, so if... if so we have... You know, we have have to dispose of trash, right? Trash, yes. Mm -hmm. We have a big problem with that. We Absolutely. Do. Yes. Yep. And so in those in those instances that, that those places mm -hmm. let off this gas. Yep. We yep. in agreement with that. Absolutely. So if I'm going to come and try to minimize the environmental impact, you're saying I shouldn't get paid to do that. You should be able to minimize the environmental impact on that, but this is not just limited to that particular industry. Well, what's, what's this the is actually one? exacerbating the problem out in rural areas with other types of. Uh, have you heard of factory farming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is where they're capturing digestate from uh, large animal feeding operations. Uh huh. And this has happened across the nation, and it's actually hurting rural communities pretty bad. But what they found is when you bring in these programs there, it incentivizes an increase in herd size. When if we just taken that money and paid the producers in those facilities to reduce the herd size, you would reduce emissions by three to 15 more times. Not only that, but this particular type of capture of gas creates a more of a concentrate 
of the waste and problems and creates a lot more ammonia and other problems. And there's recent studies showing that it's actually not even reducing emissions. Mm. Well, you know, I, you know, so, okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next in opposition, please come forward. Oh, uh, my name is Michael Berg. I'm speaking, uh, representing the Sierra Club Missouri chapter, and we oppose uh, this bill for similar reasons that were given by the uh, previous person who testified. Uh, you, if you set up programs to capture uh, CAFO, or factory farm gas, the, the studies that, that were cited before show that you're incentivizing uh, worse management, larger herds, and the actual production of more methane. And it also gives the, both the fa factory farm, uh, factory farms and the gas industries a way to sort of give a, a false solution to pollution issues, with, like, like, uh, most specifically climate change. We cannot, this is not a solution for climate change. It's not a solution, as, as was mentioned before, it's only presently only a fraction of the gas that's presently fracked can come from this. And so it, it incentivizes bad production and um, it's, it's given a false solution. So we do not support this kind of program. Thank you. So the Sierra Club is opposed to capturing methane? Not, not in all circumstances. We, we do oppose it, it uh, with, with uh, CAFOs. We do not want to set it up to capture the methane for the CAFOs because it, it encourages But they're not going away. Hmm? Well, they're, they're not going away. There's different, there's different ways of raising animals, and the, the studies are showing that when you set up the programs, it actually increases the herd sizes because you're incentivized to have production that actually increases the amount of methane, okay. methane produced. Okay, thank you. Questions for this witness? Senator May. So what's your solution? <laughs> Similar to what the previous uh, uh, man testifying said, we, we should be encouraging paying to have less herd sizes and smaller CAFOs and, and raise our meat in a, in a different way. Uh, and, and, and what's instead the cost of, to doing that? The cost to doing it? And uh, what's the impact on food? I mean, that, that's, a big, that's a big question. I think the impact is we, we have a healthier uh, plan environment for everybody. So the impact is, is positive. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? So, yeah, thank you. And, and also one note. Uh, my colleague at the Missouri Coalition for the Environment is at another hearing because these things are overlapping mm -hmm. the, the previous hearing, so I'm submitting her testimony if she doesn't get in the room quick Thank enough you. for Thank this you. bill. We'll note that. Thank you. Anybody else in opposition? Please come forward. Good morning. John Kaufman on behalf of the Consumers Council of Missouri testifying in opposition to Senate Bill 829. Um, I, I'm not here to take any, uh, uh, make any statement regarding the environmental impact of these uh, projects. I'm here talking about the rate impact. I'm here talking on behalf of residential utility customers of natural gas. Uh, this legislation would raise uh, natural gas prices for your constituents. And this, the impact here on, on this particular bill uh, would, would not be uh, near as great as some of the other bills that you're considering, but it gives us uh, this special treatment. I mean, the current law says uh, um, that this particular type of program could be passed on automatically to consumers, and uh, probably the best consumer protection that we have at the Public Service Commission is being able to look at all of the expenses and investments and, and impacts on the utility at one time so that we don't piecemeal it, we don't give a rate increase for this even when their overall expenses are going down. So this is giving uh, a special treatment for this very small and unique and yet unproven project. If, if you give automatic rate increases for what they spend here, what, you know, what's to say you aren't gonna do the next thing and the next thing? And I know that that slippery slope argument doesn't necessarily work with a lot of people, but we're, we're having a hard time keeping the, rate, the, the overall rate case process together. And this is just another, just pulling another thread out of that. And uh, it, it seems kind of unusual to me that we were just picking this one thing out and giving it special treatment and raising rates higher uh, than they need to for, for this particular project. So this is about the rate case process. 
and, um, and a desire not to have automatic rate increases, but rather to have all these things reviewed in a rate case. That's all Th I have. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any comments? Questions? Senator Perry. Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm trying to clarify. So we heard a uh, witness in support of this bill a few minutes ago share that this way of capturing the gas coming off of CAFOs is four times more expensive than other yeah. natural gas. I, um, yeah. that's, that sounds about right. Okay. So, but you, uh, in this language you're saying that the PSC wouldn't have the ability to say that something couldn't, that it would automatically have to be rolled into the rate case. Um, well, I mean, I suppose that issue, uh, I suppose they could promulgate a rule that said that that didn't happen, but I'm, I'm just assuming that if there's going to be a rulemaking that there's, give, there's going to be some special treatment given to it. I mean, the law that was passed a couple of years ago allows automatic rate increases. Okay. So that uh, automatic rate increase was from the legislation a few years ago. Right. Okay, so right. there's a chance to uh, address that in the sub that we're working on. Perhaps, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. very good, thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, anybody else in opposition, please come forward. Please leave your witness form and let us know who you are and begin your testimony. Good morning, members of the uh, Senate Committee. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, State Public Advocate. And uh, I'm opposed to current bill, Senate Bill 829. Um, this bill deals mostly with the production of animal waste versus landfills. And I really have a problem with transparency and having people travel throughout our state to a Senate committee hearing when nobody has a copy of the substitute, and yet people are talking about the substitute bill. So in my opinion, that's a violation of Chapter 610 of the Missouri Revised State Statutes of a public meeting when people come here to testify. I think that people should be armed and have the same access of the substitute bills. And as a, a few of you, uh, the senators on the committee have testified that um, you haven't had the opportunity to read that substitute. And I think that that's a crying shame. And I would ask and appeal to the committee that you also hold a public hearing when you post to the Senate uh, website, uh, that substitute committee, uh, or uh, substitute language of the uh, House bill or Senate Bill 829. There's several environmental concerns of the contaminants and what exactly happens to them. Uh, the discharge from uh, when the gas company uh, gets those contaminants and how they process it. In my opinion, this is cutting corners and cutting uh, the proper cost of disposal. Uh, this bill highly favors natural gas companies and the project costs are placed in the, on the shoulders and the backs of Missouri ratepayers. In my opinion, there needs to be more research, more questions asked, more discussion and more debates. A lot of times we rush to the whim of lobbyists and big business profits. And I think it's a high time that senators start putting Missourians first, as the governor spoke in his state as the state address last month. 90 days placed on the State Public Service Commission, as you've heard testimony from other bills and the uh, liaison from the Public Service Commission, 90 days is not enough time to vet, to do proper investigation, to hold the proper public hearings uh, to comply with state law. It's rushing the process, which leads to errors, mistakes, and it's bad for Missouri's six million citizens. We are, in my opinion, this bill is railroading Missourians uh, on a fast pace to the profits and the stockholders of Missouri natural gas companies. There are other methods that will cut the cost of 75% less of the recapturing of this methane gas and reusing it uh, in a productive, environmentally uh, sensible manner. Um, do lawmakers support gas companies or do you support Missouri consumers? And that's a question at the end of the day. And for those reasons, I'm opposed to the current bill, Senate Bill 829, especially when it's been testified that there's a substitute language and a substitute bill and no one knows what that language even says. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anybody have uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Artie. Thank you. 
Anybody else in opposition, please come forward. That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 829. Um, Senator Razor, just a minute. We're going to go into executive session real quick and vote some bills out, and then we'll get back to, uh, to the hearing. I move that we go into executive session. Do I have a second? second. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. We are now in executive session. I move that we um, vote Senate Bill 940. I, I, we move, I move that we pr uh, bring up Senate Bill 947 in front of the committee. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Eyes appear to have it. The eyes do have it. Senate Bill 947 is before the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 947 is the uh, is the Senate bill that uh, Thompson Raider presented uh, a week or two ago about about streaming video and the uh, franchise fees on those. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions on that bill? Yes. I'm going to be voting no on this, but I just wanted you and my colleagues to know I'm working with the bill sponsor on, on, on this. So. As most everything coming out of this committee, there's a long way to go. Well, yes, this, I, so. I just <laughs> wanted you to know we are actively working. I appreciate so, that thank very you. much. Senator May, did you have some questions or comments? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is... A couple of years ago, as part of the Wayfair, we, we cut franchise fees from 5% of gross receipts to 25 yes. But this is saying there's, there's some cities that are saying the services riding the broadband, uh, video streaming services like Netflix, they should be paying that same franchise tax. Court cases going on, this is saying they will not be part of that, that they will not pay taxes. The things riding the broadband stream will not be paying taxes. That's what this is doing. We did for the for the normal wire in the in the right of way, right, right. Uh -huh. And so now you're saying that you know, other streamers should be paying the two and a half. A few cities are suing, saying that people riding that wire should be paying the same franchise fee, right? And this right here is saying they should not. This is saying they can't, right? Okay. They will not require that. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Then I move that we vote do pass Senate Bill 947. Uh, Michelle, please call the roll. Senator Searpoy. Aye. Fitzwater. Bean. Burnsgetter. Aye. Esslinger. Aye. May. Aye. McCreary. No. Mosley. Rowden. Aye. Thompson Raider. <laughs> Trent. By your vote five to four, you'd voted do pass Senate Bill 947. I now move that we bring Senate Bill 789 before the committee. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Senate Bill 789 is uh, <laughs> Senator Razor's bill uh, about the uh, Liberty Hospital. And uh, is there any discussion on that? Okay, then I, uh, I move that we vote do pass uh, Senate Bill 789. Michelle, please call the roll. Senator Searpoy. Aye. Fitzwater. Bean. Burnsgetter. Esslinger. Aye. May. Aye. McCreary. Aye. Mosley. Rowden. Aye. Thompson Raider. Trent. By your vote of five to three, you voted to do pass Senate Bill 789. I now move that we. Uh,
Okay, uh, moving on now, we're going to bring up uh, Senate Committee Substitute for, I'm sorry, I want to bring Senate Bill 936 before the committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes appear to have the ayes. Do you have it? Senate Bill 936 is before the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 936 is Senate Birdsketter's bill on, on paint recycling we had, and we have a substitute on that. Uh, let me make a motion first that I vote that we adopt Senate Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 936. Now discussion. Senator Birdsketter? Would you like to tell us what this, what the uh, substitute does? Before we go on, mm -hmm. can I make a motion to reconsider? Is that possible? Ask Jim. Jim. I'm sorry, Jim. This was my mistake. Huh? I apologize. Give me a second. Read your script. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. So we now have uh, Senate Bill, the Senate Committee Substitute, I made the adoption motion on Senate Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 936. First of all, let me get a second. Do I have a second? We have a second. Now, Senator Bernsketter, would you like to tell us what the difference is in the Senate Committee Subs? So the, uh, the House came up with some uh, changes, so we want to just make the two bills uh, exactly the same. It modifies the definition of a conditionally exempt small quantity generator. Uh, as a provision relating to the incorporation of a paint assessment fee and also provides uh, an annual report to the Missouri Senate and Missouri House uh, within 15 days of the receipt of the report from the da Department of Natural Resources. Those were the... So the sub just mimics the House? The what, what, what came out of the House? Yes. Okay. Any discussion on that? <laughs> Sorry. Senator May, this is the paint recycling. When did we hear this, last week or the week before? Last week. Last week, okay. Okay. This is just setting up so people have some place to take their paints rather than landfills. So I've already made the motion, and we've had a second on the adopting the substitute. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. We have adopted the substitute for... Senate Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 936. I now move that we do pass Senate Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 936. Do I have a second? Any further discussion? Seeing none. Michelle, would you call the roll? Senator Searpoy. Aye. Fitzwater. Bean. Burnsketter. Aye. Esslinger. Aye. May. Aye. McCreary. Aye. Mosley. Rowden. Thompson Raider, Trent. No, eight to zero. Mm -hmm. By your vote of eight to zero, we have voted do pass Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill nine thirty six. I now move that we bring Senate Bill 757 before the committee. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Senate Bill 757 is before the committee. We also have a, a substitute on that that everybody has. And so uh, we'll discuss that in a minute. But first, I'd like to make an adoption motion that... I, I move that we adopt Senate Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 757. Do I have a second? We have a second. This is another bill that is uh, really uh, uh, in, in the middle of being worked on again. And um, we had a meeting yesterday that um, some, uh, some agreement was made between the industry and the different players, uh, but it's still a, a there's still negotiations going on, and I'm sure, Senator McCurry, you've been involved with some of the negotiations also. You haven't been yet? Okay, well, you will be very soon because uh, this bill is, is uh, Senator O'Loughlin's bill, trying to get replacement base load generation for base load that's coming off the grid. Uh, 
there's some disagreement right now uh, on what dispatchable power, whether that term will be used and what it means, and several other things. So, so I, I kind of let's let the committee know that this again is a work in progress. Uh, you've got the Senate committee sub, but there's going to be additional changes to that. The reason we're voting this now is just to move it along where the floor is where most of the work will occur. And so that's, I can, I can help you understand whatever part of the bill you want to, but that's the gist of it. It's, in, it's Senator Laughlin's bill to try to get base load generation uh, assured uh, as things come offline. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I agree. The, the, the original bill was saying that, yes, uh, based on, on its output. Now there's some talk on, on working with the RTO, the regional transmission operation, uh, as far as to make sure that that base load is still there. In some form, it doesn't even have to be within the state. Or, or they, if they're replacing it, that they have contracts online for firm purchases for the time lag until that generating source is online. Well, right now the thought is, um, many cases, the EPA and, and Sierra Clubs, things like that, are going to court. And, and I think the thought is generating companies, uh, the IOUs, uh, whether they use coal or wind or solar, uh, once it's in their base, they, they get their income. That's how they make their money is they get 9% return on the invested base. And so I think Senator Laughlin is trying to make sure that we don't go too far down this green path because – uh, green energy, whether it's, whether it's solar or wind, is great when it works, but when it doesn't, sometimes we still need power, and that's the problem. And that's what she's trying to make sure of. We have, we have dispatchable. By dispatchable, it means you turn a switch on, it floats. On a cloudy day or a windless day, that doesn't happen on some of the renewables. And that's what she's after, and this is not near a finished product. And I've, I've delayed this bill for several weeks trying to get more work on it. It's just time, I think, in my opinion, to, to push it to the floor where, where all the players will still be working on this. I agree. It's, it's a complicated bill. And I don't pretend uh, that it's not. I've spent a lot of time on this bill myself. Any other comments or questions? Senator just, McCray. Just a comment, Mr. Chair. I. I feel like thing, legislation and policy dealing with utilities is one of the most complex we do, things we do in this building, it and is. I'm uncomfortable having to do this on the, what feels like on the fly when I, I don't even know what we're voting on, and then I'm expected to, to intelligently represent a residential consumer perspective on the floor of the Senate, and it just it's very frustrating to me. I would prefer to be included so that I have time to talk to my mm -hmm people and my experts, and I, I'm just not sure when, when we're voting and moving things forward that I haven't even seen. It just makes me very uncomfortable because... I, I agree. And this bill is kind of uh, different in the sense that uh, it's, it, it initiated from a member from her heartfelt position, and it doesn't really have an industry person or something behind it that's, that's spreading the word. That's one of the problems that I saw a few days ago that nobody's coming around to the committee because, because it's a member's... Right. Well, effort. most of my positions are heartfelt positions yeah. oh, too, I and I don't, I don't have I don't have slick but lobbyists a lot of times behind if I, me. If I carry a bill that, that somebody has brought to me, they are going to work the hallways and do different things. Yeah, I, I understand so that's that. That's kind of the difference in this one. It's, yeah, it's, it's um, these just you know, as you know, on legislation dealing with energy and utilities, you know, you get a comma wrong or a may or a shell wrong, and it can have a billion dollar impact on somebody's utility bill. So. I just, I'm just expressing right. my frustration yeah. I, that I would love to work on these things a little bit sooner. I, and, and I held this bill up for a couple of weeks just as we continue to work on it. I just realized finally we're not going to get a finished product in my office. We're going to have to get it to the okay. floor where people like you are involved and everybody else is kind of working on the same thing. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh -huh. But I am sympathetic to that, to that uh, concern.
Red Hood's here. She's right over here. Maybe you can step on her. This bill. <laughs> so okay. I've already made a motion to adopt the Senate Committee sub. And we've uh, had a second. And so all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Say no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. We have adopted Senate Committee sub for Senate Bill 757. But his books are here. He left his book. We can't, we don't have a quorum. Apparently this bill is much less popular than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Can we? Turn to the option. 
Chris, go back. Do we have the one? Yeah. Yeah. Get a quorum. By quorum. You can vote, no. We already voted for you, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just need a do pass yeah. okay. I now move that we do pass Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 757. Do I have a second? Do we have a second? Discussion again? Seeing no further discussion, Michelle, please call the roll. Senator Searpoy. Aye. Fitzwater. Bean. Burnsketter. Esslinger. May. McCreary. Mosley, Rowden, Thompson Raider, Trent, Five. 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 By your vote of 5 2, we have voted do pass Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 757. I now move that we leave executive session. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? I appear to have it. We are out of executive session. Senator Razor, uh, I'm sorry. Senator Razor, I'm sorry to hold you up like that. Um, we're usually a little more efficient and organized, but um, what the heck. You are now going to present Senate Bill 1388. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and that previous vote, I'm fine with a little disorganization and got that through. For the record, Senator Greg Razor, uh, the 7th District of Jackson County, presenting Senate Bill 1388. Uh, I'm not sure this is a little complicated to understand what's going on, but a very easy outcome. Uh, the National Nuclear Security Administration has facility that makes the, the non-nuclear parts that modernize and refurbish our nuclear stockpile in the United States. Currently, at that location, they have 1.7 million square feet of space with 7,500 jobs, averaging $150,000 per year. A new facility will be built that will add 2.5 million square feet and 5,000 new jobs to the area. To do this, they're going to use a unique building model. This will be a federal facility once completed, but it's going to take the federal government, conservatively speaking, three to five additional years to build it rather than a private company. So what the proposal is, is to allow a private company to do it. To do so, you want to make sure that the costs stay the same. And the big hurdle they're having is sales tax. The federal government would not have to pay sales tax on the building materials. Uh, the private company will. So we're here. I introduced this bill. Uh, it would allow for this company building the facility uh, to be exempt from state and local sales tax uh, for the duration of the build. It expires after 10 years. It won't take that long. I believe the bringing 5,000 new people on more than makes up for lost revenue. Uh, it's going to be open, fully staffed years ahead of time if we don't do this. Uh, I believe the city is in favor of it. Uh, with that, I can have any questions. Thank you. So this um, sales tax is just for the state sales tax 
portion? I think it would be state and local. Is it local also? And so the, there's a local cost? Yeah, I've, I've spoken with the mayor and okay. the city manager. They're on board. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Senator Bernsker? So somebody's going to build this building, is that right? Yes. But it could be the federal government or it could be a local entity? Yes, it could be a federal government or a private company. If it's the private company, there's people behind me that can explain this much better, but I believe they would technically own the facility during the build and then immediately hand it over to the federal government. So either way it ends up as a federal facility. To get it online faster, they're looking at this private option. So there's already architectural drawings and all that? I'll let them okay, answer that right, question. I don't you. know how far along okay, that aspect you. they are. Any other questions for this, for Senator Razor? Okay, go ahead, Senator May. Just clarify for me, because normally when they're building facilities, they do, uh, they put together uh, packages, you know, that include tax credits mm -hmm. and other tax incentives. Why are we doing it? I've never heard it done on building materials. And how do we uh, make sure that the building materials that are being tax exempt are used or are going to be used at that facility? How do we police that and not this company, you know, getting tax sure. exemption on building materials where they're building other places? To answer the first part of that question, it's typically you would look at a property tax abatement for several years, but this private company is not going to own the facility long enough to take advantage of that and the federal government doesn't pay it anyway so that's just not a viable it doesn't do any good uh, so they're looking at this avenue to try to create a situation where the cost stays roughly the same regardless of who builds it uh, to the second question I'm going to let people behind me answer that if that's okay, uh, okay. how that's written into the contract Okay, awesome. I think I have one more question that was triggered by something you said. So, so is it going, so is it, is there any federal, This is this facility a federal facility? Yes. So are there any incentives from the Fed? Do we have a partnership with any of our federal Congress people, anybody, you know? As far as money to build this? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure, I'll let them. Okay, because I just remember how, you know, when we did the NGA, sure. you know, that, you know, it was the I, Congress people and the senators federally got on board to help with that project and secure that I'm, deal. I'm and sure Congressman funding. Cleaver has been involved yeah. in what capacity I, I don't know yet. Okay, very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Senator Razor? Seeing none, thank you. How many people want to speak in favor of this? How many opposed? Okay, come on forward, please. Leave your witness form and let us know who you are. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Kevin Breslin, speaking in support of Senate Bill 1388. Thank you very much for the opportunity to meet with you today. Uh, answering some of the questions that came up earlier, I, I'll try to remember them as best I can. In terms of the uh, documentation for the sales tax to make sure that it's targeted to the particular goods that are being constructed for this particular set of buildings. Uh, there is a, a fairly direct uh, documentation that must be submitted to the Department of Revenue to support the exemption. Uh, and so I think there's, there are existing controls in place to make sure that if a particular vendor were to claim the exemption, they would have to document specifically that the goods are intended for this particular use and, and identify the particular exemption that's at stake. This is a real point of sale type transaction. This isn't a future benefit. It only occurs if and when a qualified purchase is actually conducted uh, by the vendor uh, for purposes of the construction of this particular facility. So I believe there's adequate controls in place to be certain that were the exemption to exist that it would only be targeted for building materials uh, for this building. The second question I think the Senator had is um, uh, what is the support for this at the national level? Uh, the support is very significant. Uh, it's established the first of the, the 15 buildings that we plan to build out there over the next 10 years. Uh, as the Senator said, to build out that two and a half million square feet of space. 
uh, the initial appropriation is already in place. We already, the federal agency that will be ultimately acquiring this building or these buildings uh, has already received appropriated funds for the first of these buildings. So it's already um, a certainty that should we build it and complete it, it will be acquired by the government. I think that's representative of the national support for this important national security initiative. Uh, Senator testified before you quite accurately, this is an important installation in our national defense. Uh, it, the plant that we built, and I was part of the team that built the, the current facility uh, beginning back in 2010, and we, we brought uh, what was then the Honeywell Company and, and NSA down from an aging World War II plant. We brought them down and they completed their move-in in 2014. They had just under 3,000 employees at the time. They now have almost 8,000. So this has been a significant growth for the local economy, and it's representative of the fact that the mission obligations of the National Nuclear Security Administration at this location has grown so significantly. And yet, they've outgrown the space, and they now need to double that capacity to meet workload that they already know exists for the next 15 to 20 years. The senator was correct. They're essentially modernizing an aging nuclear stockpile. Some of those systems are 20 and 30 years old. They need to be refurbished. They need to be modernized in order to make sure that they're safe and protective um, for our national defense purposes. So this is a critical, a vital function that needs to be performed, and they simply need additional infrastructure to accomplish their national defense mission, and that's what this is about. Now, the senator indicated why is it being done in this particular method. This is a federal building that we're building, but it's being constructed by the private sector on what's called a build-to-suit or turnkey basis. Traditionally, the federal government would let its construction contracts for services. It would be the acquiring party. It would be the vendor. It would scope it. It would design it. It would build it. We all know how long that takes. It takes considerably longer. The senator is right. It's probably three to five years longer. The agencies need to bring these facilities online more rapidly has caused them to look at doing it a different way. Let the private sector, using the private sector's skills and experience at creating modern infrastructure for them, let us design it, let us build it. They give us the specification. We have to complete the project to meet their needs, and we can do it in a fraction of the time and probably at significantly more, uh, better and probably less costly in the end. And so that's why this is being procured in a slightly different way. Uh, and just to keep the, the playing field level, uh, to complete this federal project through this private delivery method for immediate conveyance to the federal government upon completion, uh, we would like to carry the what would otherwise be a, t a sales tax exempt transaction uh, and apply it to this particular building model. If, if we were constructing a building for Jackson County, it would be tax exempt. If we were building a structure for your congregation, it would be tax exempt because those are existing tax exemptions. There's just a, a gap in the current tax law that, that we're trying to address with this rather novel way of standing up federal facilities um, of critical need. So the sale, local sales tax, is this bill doesn't cover that? They did that on their own? or how is, I'm sorry. How, do, how is the local sales tax avoided? The local sales tax? How are they avoided? How are they awarded? Avoided. Yes, I'm sorry. Pardon me, Senator. All of the sales taxes would be included, both the state and the local this tax bill? component. This yes, bill sir. does that. Okay, so uh, sales tax is usually a point of sales. I mean, if I go to Lowe's or Home Depot or something, the, the TIFs, the TIDs, all the stuff that apply to that point are at applied that, to that point, receipt. At the retail point right. of sale, which for us, we'd be building steel, buying well, steel. What's up, Senator? You can buy that in state if you're buying steel. Where are you, I mean, these buildings, it takes a massive amount of concrete and steel. It does. So you're buying those everywhere in the country, I assume. Those, those are taxable transactions, yeah, and we're buying right. them in the, in, in the marketplace. Right. Uh, but that's, that's a taxable transaction when it's constructed, or when it's included in the part of a completed building. Even if you buy them out of state? Even if it's bought out of state. It's there is a local sales? Missouri. This is the point of sale. Okay, thank you. Okay, questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. I, I, would, I would add one more fact, if I may, Mr. Sure. Mr. Chairman. The income tax generated just during the construction phase of these buildings offsets the amount of the exemption. I'm not, not even talking about the permanent mm -hmm. yield to the state in terms of income tax by bringing these, these permanent jobs online more quickly. Just, just the construction period 
uh, income taxes that will be generated of more than offsets the amount of the exemption. So this is a, a, a very positive development across the board. And obviously the, the opportunity to create these permanent jobs is very, very significant for the local economy. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the testimony. Next in favor, you, please Senator. come forward. Mr. Chairman of the Rest Committee, thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is Terry Anderson. I am with, uh, here on behalf of the project developer, um, and I'll be brief today um, as my business partner covered a lot of it, but the economic impact and the importance of adding these jobs in this facility, um, you know, high-tech manufacturing and engineering jobs that are nearly permanent um, for the state of Missouri um, is highly important, and you know, the sales tax exemption helps make that happen. So i um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the testimony. Any questions by the remaining members? Seeing none. Next in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman and committee member, Shannon Cooper today representing the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce as well as the Civic Council of Greater Kansas City, which is going to go on record in support of this. Uh, there's a little discussion about the local sales tax. Our community's happy to forego that in exchange for these new jobs. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Question for Shannon. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Next in favor, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, Sam Panateri on behalf of the City of Kansas City and the South Kansas City Chamber. Um, it's been said before, but we'd obviously be uh, willing to forego um, some of the sales tax for the brevity of the project to get these 5,000 quality jobs um, in our community. Thank you. Questions for Senator? Senator McCrary. Thanks for being here. So I'm, this is, I'm looking at the fiscal note, um, and although I live on the east side of the state, I'm still, I'm intrigued by, like, you're representing the city today, and then someone was here right before you representing the chamber. There's a significant negative impact on a lot of entities within Kansas City, including Jackson County, Kansas City, the Kansas City Zoo, just from, you know, of like the, to the tune of like 6.7 million per year, basically. Um, so in your opinion, the benefit of this bill outweighs the negative fiscal impact? Yeah, for sure. So okay. on balance, 5,000 quality jobs, they mentioned the um, salaries of those jobs. Um, the earnings tax alone would be surpass that and, okay. and make this totally worth it. And that, of course, one of the limitations with the fiscal notes is it's not, it often doesn't take in the whole, you know, 30,000 sure. foot view. So you feel like the 6.7 million negative impact to local funds um, would be offset by positives. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Senator, Senator if I may. I I think we heard earlier that just the construction phase alone pays for the fiscal note that you're talking about. The, just the breadth of this, yeah, the temporary jobs, the breadth of this project, that takes care of the fiscal note. Okay, and I might have missed that. I was in emerging issues at the tail end, so my apologies for yes. missing the intro. Thank you. Right, the, pay, the payroll, the earnings tax on the construction workers and stuff, so yes. Next, a favor, please come forward. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Jim Erickson. Um, on behalf of the Economic Development Corporation of Kansas City, Missouri, um, we are obviously a close partner of the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and we want to uh, strongly support this bill. Um, obviously, the 5,000 jobs and 2.5 million square feet of new development is great. And you know, speaking a little bit to the, the fiscal note that you just mentioned, the, the value of putting these jobs and this construction online earlier, uh, which this uh, bill would help do um, by allowing private contractors uh, to us uh, shows significant value and uh, is a big reason we support this. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you for coming forward. Next in favor, please come forward. First person in opposition, please step forward. Bring your witness form and let us know who you are. Hello, committee members. Uh, Jeff Stack is my name. I'm with the Mid-Missouri Fellowship of Reconciliation, and I am uh, here to speak in opposition 
uh, to this measure, to SB 1388. No disrespect to my neighbor here. I uh, appreciate a lot of work he does. But I think that uh, SB 1388 is it's really a short-sighted measure uh, on many counts. Yeah, sure, it will, it will provide jobs. There's no doubt about that, 5,000 jobs. I want people to have work as well. But um, I think we have to talk about some of the other aspects of this. Um, this Honeywell, the corporation that uh, is overseeing this operation, uh, is going to be receiving ultimately $16 billion for this project to make it possible. Um, and um, you know, it's money that uh, we're getting corporate welfare again, the state is. And it's not really the way we ought to be operating as a state, I don't believe. Um, I am, uh, you know, I, again, jobs are good. But, but there are places, there are ways to, you know, when we talk about no, no um, local taxes being paid by Honeywell, I think that that is pretty, pretty disheartening when you think in terms of the impact of the current plant on the people of the area, the workers. Uh, there was a report uh, by... Um, by KSHB back in 2001, or 2011 rather, April 2011, uh, that looked at the impact of the prior plant that, that the individual referring to, Bannister Complex. Uh, 154 people apparently died from impacts of, 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 the, uh, of the plant from exposures to various uh, toxic chemicals. Uh, the Department of Labor reported that uh, well in excess of 900 toxins uh, were produced at the nuclear weapons parts plant. And by the way, uh, the plant makes 85% of non-nuclear parts of the nuclear weapons that are made in our country. Uh, they contribute to a doomsday uh, scenario for, for life on the planet. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment here. But these, um, the, many people have, have a couple hundred more people uh, were, were uh, uh, harmed by exposure to different toxins uh, at that plant. So the plant now to expand it, yeah, there's been this massive expansion, as was referred to, and a new facility that will be open. Uh, they've begun operation at the new facility. But this is a long-term uh, investment in really the, the possible annihilation of humankind. We shouldn't be a party to that. In fact, what I'd rather see Missouri do, I'd rather see lawmakers work towards legislation which will uh, oppose the making of weapons which could lead to uh, death of all humankind and, and much life on this planet. Uh, at the current time, there are about uh, 12,000 uh, warheads, nuclear warheads in the world. The vast majority are, um, are made by the United States and Russia. Uh, and there's a mo this modernization plan, a, a trillion dollars during the Obama administration to modernize, and that's what this money is, is, has been made available to do. Uh, in Missouri. And I guess, you know, when we think in terms of Kansas City again, I mean, we're making, can't continue to make Kansas City really a, a ground zero. If there should be a nuclear exchange. This, this plant is going to be made. This bill is about a sales tax exemption. Could, yes. you, could you put your comments to that area? We're not going to argue nuclear policy in here. Well, that's kind of what this is all about, central to it, and it should be a central component of what's being considered. You know, if we want to give a break to companies that are making weapons uh, as, chairman mass of, destruction. as chairman of commerce i have a lot to say about local utilities nothing about national nuclear policy well that's what this whole bill is about though chair with re with respect i mean that's what this is all about at okay. its crux and so i guess just to remind folks that one nuclear weapon exploded along like for instance uh, the the i can i can group talked about the fact that one nuclear weapon alone uh, exploded over New York City, for instance, would result in more than okay. 500,000 okay. people being killed. Okay. That's what we're working towards building there, and I'd encourage okay. the, uh, the committee to reconsider Thank you. going down this, this path. Okay. Thank you. Any comments, please? Thank you for appearing. Next, in opposition, please come forward. And if we can keep your comments about the sales tax exemption, I'd appreciate it. My name's Michael Berg with the Missouri Sierra Club, and again, I have to reiterate what, what the, the former speaker said, want the jobs, support Kansas City, but um, it is about the nuclear act aspect. The Sierra Club's got a policy to oppose, uh, to, to draw down nuclear weapons and not have as big of an arsenal as we have now, and to work to end nuclear war. So we don't see it as, if, if, if I was speaking out because I didn't want incentivization of methane gas production, I would be remiss to 
not speak out about incentivization of production of nuclear weapons, which, as the previous speaker noted, could annihilate the human race. Comments? Uh, any questions or comments for this witness? Thank you. Next in opposition, please come forward. Good morning, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, State Public Advocate, and I'm opposed to SB 1388, uh, authorizing a sales tax for profits of a private developer. Uh, this bill is unfair for Kansas City only, and it's the wrong. It's wrong to the rest of the state of Missouri. This bill picks winners and losers, and the loss is 6.7 million dollars. Uh, in revenue to the state while the private developer yields great profits. Um, I'm sure that the private developer is going to give a $6.7 million uh, uh, minus the construction costs to the federal government. Sales tax revenue is needed for the state general uh, fund. It staffs employees and staff members of the State Department of Natural Resources. Uh, it pays for costs of inspections pays for construction review. Uh, sales tax revenues go to pay for these employees and inspections and now will be borne by the General Assembly in coming up with our ever decreasing uh, budget this year, trying to um, balance our state budget and appropriations. Who's going to pay for the fees and the cost of the state to the construction inspections and to make sure that sound building requirements are being met with the International Building Code. Um, sounds like the federal, sounds like this is a federal mandate without providing appropriations from Congress, uh, which I'll be running for Congress uh, in this up and coming election. This bill is setting the wrong state policy. There's too many secrets and too many unknowns uh, at this point. It sounds like the contractor will be building this facility and it's gonna be turned over to the federal government what happens in the nuclear waste, like the federal government dumped the waste in North St. Louis County and St. Charles County is affecting citizens' lives, health, and families. Many loved ones were lost due to uh, disease and health concerns due to the exposure of nuclear waste being mishandled by the federal government and contractors. This is a very scary project in our state. I think the public should be outraged. I haven't heard of any public hearings thus far. What are the environmental impact and ramifications on the citizens of Jackson County? Look at the environmental impact and lessons learned from the past. Kansas City will be a world target now uh, in terms of if there is an outbreak of a war. I'm opposed to this ridiculous SB 1388, giving profits to a private contractor at the expense of taxpayers, paying for services and inspections that are needed for this project by the state of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your comments. Any, any questions? Seeing none. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else in opposition? Uh, anybody for information purposes? Senator Rader, I just want to make sure I have clarification. This is for the non-nuclear components of nuclear weapons, right? Okay. Right. Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is the non-nuclear right. parts of our nuclear weapon arsenal. Right. Uh, I would say I, too, would love to live in a world where these weapons don't exist. Uh, they are becoming not just two superpowers that have them now, uh, and it's dangerous. What is also dangerous is to have aging weapon systems using old technology. Uh, we need to modernize this to keep them safe, to ensure that accidents don't happen. And that's what we will be doing in Kansas City. Uh, the, the 6.7 million in lost revenue, we've already talked about that. We've more than make up for it. So this is a, a smart plan to keep our existing <clears throat> weapon arsenal safe. Thank you, Senator. That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 1388. Next up is Senate Bill 1422. Senator Black, I'm sorry it took so long to get to you, and I'm sorry my committee is, uh, I have committee members complaining they don't know about these bills, and then they don't sit through the committee hearing. Thank you, Senator. I, I caused this lengthy problem in another committee today. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, member of the committee. 
For the record, my name is Rusty Black and I represent the 12 cent district. Senate Bill 1422 has been introduced in response to the pressing need for reliable baseload power, recognizing the increasing demand for on-demand energy. Independent of weather conditions, the bill aims to ensure a stable energy supply amidst the shifting landscape of economic development. With burgeoning projects like large manufacturing facilities and data centers on the horizon, the necessity for continuous 24-7 power generation is paramount. Recently, MISO and NERC said in its assessment that they face a 1,300 megawatt shortfall beginning next summer, which, co which continues to grow throughout the 10-year assessment period as coal, nuclear, and natural gas generation retire faster than replacement resources are connected. Senate Bill 1422 was filed as a replacement for Senate Bill 1247, which was heard about a month ago after a meeting and taking suggestions from the Public Service Commission and removing what I would refer to as the controversial sections. We came up with Senate Bill 1422. Some of the pieces that were removed included the predetermination process and the construction work in progress financing provision. Senate Bill 1422 allows the use of plant and service accounting or PISA for natural gas plants. The use of PISA makes it feasible to get back the full investment that a utility makes in these generation projects. Additionally, Senate Bill 1422 allows for utilities to depreciate 100% of the expenses associated with all qualifying electrical plant expenses rather than 85%. This is a meaningful change due to the size of the potential natural gas project. Lastly, Senate Bill 1422 extends the sunset date of the provisions related to deferrals by electrical corporations from December 31, 28 to December 31, 35, and the deadline to file an application seeking permission for PSC related to deferrals shall be extended from December 31, 26 to December 31, 33, seven-year extension. I believe it's necessary to expand sunset due to the length of time it takes to build new generate. Boy, we just talked about length of time building. Build new generational facilities, especially natural gas. Thank you for your time. I know that it's getting short. I'll try to answer questions, but both of you know how I can be long-winded. I would recommend you ask the experts behind me. They'll be a lot shorter. Senator McCray. I'm going to ask you anyway because ultimately I'm going to have to deal with you on this bill. So. Um, I wanted Smile to, when you say that well, after you talked about age yesterday on the floor. Well, all I did was ask if you were older than the chair, and for some reason you took offense to that. Can you believe? <laughs> anyway, so um, I wanted to. That makes me a little bit happy. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would. Um, I wanted to hear your thinking on why you uh, struck 85 percent and moved. Uh, to 100%. Uh, I was around years ago when that deal, when that was part of the deal to get uh, this special accounting measure passed. And I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I, I don't know why you wouldn't want the utility to have to have some skin in the game. And that's what the 85% did. So why, why did you strike that and move to 100%? Okay, as a business person myself I mean most people in this room probably don't consider that but when I buy a piece of equipment well that do, that doesn't I, I buy a piece of equipment on yeah, farm. But how much about, of it do I get to expand you're talking about the free market this is a monopoly this is monopoly they're using our money they're using I'm our a monopoly constituents at my house because I make the decisions okay go ahead with your analogy then go ahead yeah, so th that that is the that is the reason as we make those investments into facilities, especially the cost they are today compared to 10 years ago, 15 years ago, et cetera, I don't think it's too much to ask for the utilities to be able to depreciate 100% of those. Off the, the consumer gets the value of the plants. The I see that. It puts all the risk on our constituents, the people we were sent here to represent, and not just residential. It puts it on to businesses, a one-person business all the way up to a Fortune 500 company. Yes. That's, that's what that's doing. So you're okay with that? Yes. With a monopoly not having any skin in the game? Well, I believe they have skin in the game because of all the other processes that they have to go through to come up with an electrical rate. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, how many people want to testify in favor of this bill? How many opposed? Okay. When you do, please be brief because it's getting late. And I hate to rush people, but it's it's being late. It's the first person in support, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Jason Clint, representing Evergy. I want to thank you and want to thank the committee for their attention to this important bill. Um, I will be very brief because we have heard 1247, and so they're really the reasons that we talked about with this bill, just as a quick reminder, was from an Evergy perspective, we are growing the pie. So the economic development that we are seeing is increasing our load. And when you increase the load, you have to increase the 24-7 generation that's beneath it. That's the point of this bill. I won't go through unless you want me to uh, why we're seeing those load additions and what's coming down the pike, although it is very interesting. Um, but what I, what I would say is the rep, uh, senator woo, did a nice job there of explaining the bill, um, and, and so I won't go into too much more detail, but ex, uh, that does allow us to use the PISA accounting uh, to help build that natural uh, gas plan. It also extends the sunsets because of the length of time that it takes for natural gas generation. But this is important for Missouri. It's important for Kansas City in order for us to continue to be able to attract the large economic development loads that are coming down the pipeline. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will take any questions uh, anyone has. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Jason. Next in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, Shannon Cooper today representing the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. Just uh, echo what my friend Mr. Clint said. Uh, we are noticing issues with companies interested in coming to the Kansas City region but are concerned about our lack of base load power. We feel like this legislation moves us further along to where we can remain attractive and competitive to companies wanting to relocate or start business in Kansas City who are large electrical users. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Senator McCray. So you're speaking on behalf of the chamber right now? Correct. Okay. So you've got members of all different sizes of companies. We so do. since since that PISA law went into effect, it's raised electric rates by about ten percent. So you realize that by testifying in support of a, a special type of accounting that it's it's having a negative impact on not just, you know, residential people but also businesses as well. Senator, we, we go through a, a very long and belabored process when we take positions on legislation. Uh, uh, our membership has worked with Evergy. We, we have a, a need to increase generation in Kansas City if we want to continue to be a competitive community in this state. Uh, I've attended meetings for close to 20 years. I can't recall a time when we had chamber members come and say, my electric rates are too high. We want the chamber to take a position to oppose legislation such as this. Okay. So now, I'm not saying we might not have a member or two that okay. dislikes this, but that has not been brought to our attention as we go through our process. Okay. So you don't hear from, from right. businesses about utility right. rates. Okay. And, and, you know, that might change by tonight after people sitting behind me might hear that and reach out to the chamber. But as we went through this process, we did not have people oppose us supporting this legislation. Okay. Thank you. Thank next, you. Next, in favor, please come forward. Chairman and committee member, uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 1422. My name is Warren Wood. I'm an engineer. I've spent most of my life working around electric generating plants, and I'm Amherst, Missouri's Vice President of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs. Electric service providers, regional transmission organizations, and national reliability oversight, oversight groups have all been watching a continued reduction in, in reserve margins, really the reliability of the overall national grid. Uh, they've been issuing a number of reports and calls to actions to that effect. If you look at this trend in just Missouri, so the last natural gas plant went online in 2015, and that since then, we've seen 40 power plants close in the state of Missouri. To be fair, that most of these are small units, a couple megawatts, uh, but more than 10 of them are more than 100 megawatts, and the total here is over 3,000 megawatts of load being lost since 20, or 
generation since 2015. That's more than two Callaways. As a provider of electric service to our customers and communities, we're concerned about the reliability and the economic development. We are concerned about energy affordability and the access to the electricity. We see enormous electric demand growth opportunities, reshoring of industries, uh, and we're going to be turning down uh, new customers to the region. We don't have the electricity to serve them, and that's not a good place for the state to be looking forward. Uh, the Senator did a great job hitting the pieces that have been removed from Senate Bill 1247 now in this bill, all the generation transmission predetermination, all of the rate making treatment, all the quick recovery has been removed. Uh, and just, you know, what it does do, he talked about adding natural gas electric generation that is in there, it was excluded in the original bill and in the renewed bill uh, from two years ago. Uh, it, did, it did move the sunset out. Really that sunset, what it does is it gets us through the next two uh, natural gas generating units we're looking at building. And it does allow full recovery of the prudently incurred cost to build those infrastructures and other infrastructure, electric infrastructure. Um, what the legislation doesn't do, it leaves the pieces that were in, eff in effect in the original bill and the renewed bill in two years ago. It does not revise the 2.5% piece of impact cap on customer rates. It doesn't require the PSC approve these projects and it, it does not inhibit the PSC's ability to assess an imprudence a challenge on uh, the infrastructure investments we're making. Decisional prudence or execution prudence on a project we decide to move ahead with. With that, I welcome any questions, Jeff. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. Next in favor, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Senator McCreary, uh, Philip Arnson with the Missouri Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry. We'd like to go on the record in support. Uh, we believe this legislation will make sure we can continue to um, have more opportunities for uh, constructing new generation uh, for our utilities around the state. Um, that will also help make sure we can have a reliable and resilient grid, um, which is a priority of our members. And then additionally, um, we've seen a, you know, positive results from the plan and service accounting, uh, accounting that has been passed previously. Um, we think that would translate well to electrical generation, or Thank to generation. You. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Next in favor, please come forward. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee. My name is Rich Aubuchon. I'm here on behalf of Hunt Midwest. Hunt Midwest is based out of Kansas City. We are a developer, and we have uh, several large projects you know, going right now that, it, uh, quite frankly, are being impacted by the ability of you know, having available power. So today we have the largest mega site in the state of Missouri. It's over 3,000 acres, contiguous acres. Uh, that's, so it's one, one parcel uh, right next to the airport. And in that particular situation, we are trying to build out uh, uh, facilities with people rehoming their, their manufacturing facilities into, into Missouri, uh, into the United States from, from overseas. Uh, and we're having trouble right now with site selectors when they come in, and quite frankly, we're losing opportunities when we don't offer enough power. And so we, we obviously source from Evergy, uh, and uh, we're having situations where the site selectors are, are being told that we can't offer the solution for them. Uh, this is a very real problem for us. Uh, we are uh, right now uh, having uh, opportunities to fill out the six million square feet that we have underground today in the subtropolis. Um, but frankly, that, that's also been a problem for us to fill out because of uh, the lack of available power. Price has not been the consideration, it's availability. Uh, that, that said, obviously there's a, a balance in that, of course. Uh, and for 20 years we told everybody in the world that we had the lowest power you know, cost around. Uh, and we had uh, plenty of availability that that is gone and now the cost is not the biggest factor when it comes to availability thank you for questions thank you next in favor thank please you. go forward first person opposition please go forward hello again john kaufman on behalf of consumers council of missouri and i am here on behalf of residential customers uh, testifying in opposition to PISA. Uh, PISA, in my, in my opinion, is one of the most anti-consumer aspects of the law relating to Missouri utilities. In fact, it, uh, strangely, it, Missouri is the only state in the country that allows this extra compensation to the utilities. Uh, no other state allows it. Um, 
It has, um, according to the staff of the Missouri Public Service Commission, the current PISA law uh, causes rates to be about 9.74 percent higher than otherwise would be. So I'm actually struggling, first of all, I'm struggling with how this bill relates to base load generation at all. It relates to, it would expand it to natural gas plants, uh, but, but base load plants such as coal and nuclear are not included in it. Uh, it was a, the, the law was originally billed as something that was only for distribution primarily, and, and that's where the 10% the burden that we already have is. Uh, I'm not sure what extra the ad adding natural gas plants would do to that. Um, natural gas plants are not exact, I, I guess some natural gas plants are considered base load, but that's, uh, th those are really sh uh, much shorter construction periods. I'm not really sure why that was added. I'm also not sure, sure why the incentive would be completely taken out of this bill. The, the reason that I understand from, from the floor debate and, and compromise made in 2018 is that the, that the 15 percent was left as an incentive for the utility to manage the project and to be cost efficient about uh, what projects were put in there. With 100 percent retroactive depreciation, this, this adder. Uh, would would eliminate all the incentive that the utility has to manage these projects, probably leading to even more cost or more cost overruns. Uh, this is not a fair way to set rates. It treats some expenses more favorably than others. Again, uh, not you go retroactively back and get depreciation, but you don't retroactively go back and capture other things that may have happened in the past that that had uh, that would have caused the utility's overall cost uh, to go down. So, it, so it's unfair in that way. It eliminates the built-in incentives that you need when you're dealing with a monopoly utility, and it just simply would raise rates. So the, going from 85 to 100 percent would raise rates by probably a couple percent. Adding natural gas plants to this very extra uh, recovery system would also raise rates. Uh, so uh, for that reason, uh, we're, we're opposed. I think this is a, is a very unnecessary rate increase. It doesn't get any additional service or any better service. I, I really am struggling to follow the reasoning that somehow this is going to lead to more adequate resources. Uh, in, uh, um, looking at the, the integrated resource plans, which are quite extensive for both uh, at least Evergy and Ameren, uh, I do not see any real worries on, on the, the future for being able to provide for any new customers. Uh, it's um, definitely not on the horizon from what what, what I've seen in those, uh, those proceedings that really look in depth at what is available uh, by these electric companies. So I, I don't think the legislation is needed. Uh, we, would, we would like you to get rid of PISA altogether. We think it's an anomaly and an anti-consumer burden that is unfair. Thank you. Questions, comments? Thank you. Next in opposition, please come forward. Please leave your witness form and let us know who you are. I did it online, Mr. Chairman. I'm learning technology. Uh, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, my name is Jay Hardenbrook. Uh, I'm the advocacy director for AARP here in the state of Missouri. We're a social change organization that represents the 50 plus. Uh, we have over 700,000 members in the state of Missouri alone. Um, much like the Consumers Council, we were opposed to PISA to begin with. Um, we continue to be opposed to the expansion of it. Uh, I think one of the things that is, um, well, it rings a little false um, and, and bothers me considerably is utility companies coming and saying it's not enough that we're a monopoly, it's not enough that there are um, unprecedented investment from the federal government in the energy infrastructure, both here and nationwide, but that we are so bad at being a monopoly that we haven't planned ahead um, for baseload power. We don't. So, bad, so badly, in fact, that we have to do a 10 percent increase on every ratepayer in the state of Missouri. Um, this seems unnecessary to me and seems like something that really takes, once again, <laughs> takes the uh, risk off of these monopoly utilities and puts them on your constituents. Um, we oppose this legislation and we oppose PISA in general. Thank you. Questions, sir? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next in opposition, please come forward. Mr. Chairman and Senator McCreary, 
Um, I will be brief. I spoke um, a few weeks ago on a different piece of legislation, and I think you're aware of the Missouri Industrial Energy Consumers. They form a lot of the base of Missouri's economy. Um, I think that to, to shorten the discussion a little bit, I would point out that you're getting one set of facts from the utilities and a different set of facts from consumers. And I think you frequently find that to be an issue because these are complex issues and it takes a lot of information and backup to really understand um, which perspective is correct. And so we're taking very complex issues and making them very short. So I will cut to the chase. If you take a look at the rating agency reports for Missouri's utilities, they are growing at a very rapid rate. You're talking about a, a, an asset growth, growth rate that is six to eight percent, which is very high, and that's, that's a compounded rate. So you're talking about very large investments being made very quickly. Amer itself has said it's got about a $48 billion pipeline in the next 20 years of projects, okay? And a lot of those are gonna be allocated to Missouri and one of the biggest risks that is presented by this massive growth of you know, closing down fossil fuel plants that have already been paid for by ratepayers and are cost effective, moving to renewables, we're not disagreeing with that decision, but you're gonna be teetering under an enormous investment and that is taking money directly out of Missouri's economy. The jobs that Ameren creates by bringing in or buying power okay, are minimal okay, compared to the amount of jobs that will be lost as electric rates become so high that the cost is not competitive for industry. Residential customers will be captive. A large company, if their electricity rates go up too much, they can locate overseas, they can move to other states. Residential customers can't. So what you end up seeing is, and I'm not exaggerating, it, it, easily a cratering of the economy. S&P Global Ratings put out a report less than 60 days ago that made it very clear that the biggest risk that is being faced right now that utilities have to manage and state regulators most importantly have to manage is that customer affordability is now placing a limit on what utilities can be able to do, that it's a credit risk to the utilities that they're spending so much money so quickly that they're going to run up against an economic wall. And as their customer base erodes, okay, and as large businesses and small businesses can't either purchase that much energy or they reduce their energy usage or they move, you're gonna have your average citizens that are gonna have very high rates. This is happening especially in the South in the southern states where the utilities have a great deal of influence and we're finding that the average residential rate payer has unaffordable rates. We don't wanna see that happen in Missouri. I would encourage the committee to review the rating agency reports when you get differing views or we don't have enough capacity or right, you know, we, we can't attract businesses. I, those things are, in our view, absolutely untrue. Um, but they're complicated issues. So I would just refer you to the rating agency reports and I'm always glad to discuss this with any of the committee members offline and we appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comments. Anybody, Senator McCray. First of all, I would, uh, if you could point me in the direction of that S&P report, I would appreciate that. Sure, um, I have it right here actually. Okay. I don't want to take your only copy, but I would love to look at it. And then my question for you is, um, so you're here representing business, businesses. Uh, yeah, large manufacturers, large right. power users. So I heard the bill sponsor and some of the witnesses testify in support of this that they w think that they have to have this bill in order to have enough power to attract businesses. So I'm hearing you say the opposite of that. Yes. So they already can do what they need to do to, uh, to grow these plants. They're, they're, this they're is just massive investments in new plants. There is, is no shortage of capacity, and the investments are so large that they're actually becoming a credit risk. They, like I said, the more they spend, the more they make. And PISA just makes things worse. It amplifies the problem, and it, and it really doesn't provide any benefit to consumers 
and it really makes it much more likely that utilities will overspend. The, the few protections that existed in the PISA law are completely wiped out by this. So you're looking at multiple mechanisms the utilities keep throwing at the committees. We have to have something more and more. They don't. And there's going to be a real economic harm from these types of laws. Okay. And I know it's difficult when you have two different sets of facts. So we're always glad to talk offline. Well, considering there's only two of us here. And, and, and I, also there's no time. I know. I, yeah, I, well, I, 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 these are very important discussions. And quite honestly, I'm embarrassed that there aren't more people here to hear this because, you know, I would, I would argue that some of the bills we hear in this committee have the most impact on our constituents of any other, of these other committees that are going on. So like you said, just a few words. PISA is a perfect example. A few words in this bill are worth billions of dollars. Right. Right. And that's what I think I'll have to work out with the bill sponsor and the chair, figuring out a way to, to make sure that uh, the utilities have some skin in the game on this. So very good. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Any, next person in opposition, please come forward. Good uh, morning. I'm still Michael Berg with the Missouri Sierra Club. Just want to briefly be on record. We agree with the uh, uh, against uh, Senate Bill 1422. We agree with the consumer ar uh, arguments against it. And just in general, the bill would um, allow utilities to proportionally spend more on gas plants compared to reliability of transmission, the distribution of the grid, and don't think that's the best for the environment and could uh, have problems if there was severe weather events or severe problems in accessing the rest of the grid in the country. So that's why we're opposed. Thank you. Any comments? Thank you very much. Next in opposition, please come forward. How many more people in opposition besides Artie? Okay, last one. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, State Public Advocate. I'm opposed to Senate Bill 1422. Um, this bill is for stockholders and executives of power companies and increases costs borne on the backs of Missouri citizens. 100% deferral is just unexcusable. It's a shame. Let's call it what it is on its face. It's a tax break. It's all about money and profits and screw Missourians all the way to the bank. Who wins in the Missouri Senate? Electrical corporations with high priced lobbyists or six million Missourians? Pay to play maneuvers is what I call this bill. In this case, cutting depreciation taxes while Missourians, your neighbors, pay the deferred loss of the revenues. Let's call this bill what it is a huge favor and tax cut cut to electrical utilities. Senators, read between the lines. This SB 1422 um, is um, passing on cost to Missourians, and this bill is just totally unfair. This is a private ind industry. It should be born on the power companies to build their infrastructure on their own dime. It's not for Missourians to make profitable stockholders and profitable executives. Just look at their bonuses given this year alone to the executives of Ameren UE in Kansas City Light and Power. It's atrocious, it's embarrassing, and it is highway robbery in my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in opposition or for information purposes? That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 1422, Senator Black, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. That will conclude the hearing on uh, commerce today. Thank you. We're adjourned.